Thank you for joining us today for the worship service at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Our desire is to equip believers to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Calvary Road has a dynamic ministry committed to worshiping God, loving others, serving others, and inviting others. Let's worship together. Good evening, good evening. Good to see you out tonight. We're going to ask you to stand at this time as we sing our opening hymn, On Jordan's Stormy Banks. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. As our musicians play, you turn around and greet each other. Father, we're so grateful tonight that the promised land is a promise. It's not a hope or a dream. It's a reality. And tonight, for those of us that know you as our Savior, it's a very sure promise. There's a very real place called heaven that a very real Savior made a way for us to go. I am so thankful tonight that we have been told the truth and it is the truth that will set us free. And one glorious day we'll stand with you in the promised land. Father, we are so thankful that in the middle of our week now we can come together. We can worship you through song and then we can hear about what you're doing, what you're hand is is moving in and we're very grateful tonight for this wonderful opportunity i pray that in everything that's done it'll bring honor and glory to you in jesus name amen I 
thought of all the songs I wrote, thought of all the deeds I done. It seemed I lived my whole life over again. You know we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive the things done in our bodies, whether it be good or bad. Can you imagine having to stand before someone so great that even the heavens and the earth will have to flee away from before his face? Well, friend, whether you believe it or not, you too someday will have to stand in judgment and give an account of the things done in this life. I tried to think of some good things that I had done but I knew that all my righteousness was his filthy rags in his sight. And I thought of the words of Job, Oh, that man could plead with God for man. And then I plainly saw his face. He then stood up to take my place. Tears filled my eyes as he began my plea. He said she's broken all the laws, but I stand now to plead her cause. She's one of those that you gave to me. The book of life was written plain, and praise the Lord they found my name. And with the pride I heard it understood. Though all my deeds were written down, yet not a stain of sin was found, because they'd all been covered Amen. by the blood. The blood that flowed from Calvary still reaches down to you and me. It's the only thing that'll save this fallen race. And when you stand before the throne, the only claim that you can own is your redemption by amazing grace. Amen. How true, how true. It's just the blood. And I'm so glad that when he sees me, and when he'll see me, he'll see the blood of his son. Uh, if it was just me standing there, that'd be an awful, awful scene. But because of the blood, we're able to stand. And I'm so thankful tonight for my salvation and for the blood of Jesus. Amen. I hope you've had a good day. I, uh, it's been a beautiful day. These days in the fall, they're hard to beat. Uh, great temperatures, the sky couldn't be any bluer or prettier, and uh, just very thankful for the beauty of these days. And, uh, you know, tonight is one of those nights that uh, we look forward to. fact of the matter is, uh, if I asked you tonight to write down everything we support, every ministry we support, every missionary we support, could you remember it? Probably not. I would struggle to remember all of it the names and the ministries, the missionaries, but we're so very blessed tonight to, to be able to stand in front of the congregation and say that that's the case. I'm glad that we don't just have a couple, and that's all that we're involved in. Many ministries that God has brought our way, many missionaries, things that God's doing. Uh, a few years ago, God brought to us a man uh, from Salem Ranch, and we heard his story what God's doing on that ranch and uh, how God's moved and it touched us and we immediately felt like this is something God would want us to be involved in. And so we're very honored tonight to have uh, Brother Terry with us and one of those participants is with us. And so we're going to move into this service because uh, the young one is going to head out and actually go speak not only a little bit here, but he's going to go talk to our youth as well in just a little bit. So we're honored to have them. As soon as the video's over, Brother Terry, uh, Mr. Terry, he said plain Terry. I call him Mr. Terry. I'm afraid he'll put me to work if I don't. And uh, so he might have something big for us to do. We was able to have lunch with him yesterday and 
he talked hunting about three-fourths of it, so I know where his mind's at, and I hope he's got refocused tonight. No, <laughs> I'm just messing with him. Got a video coming, and then after that, brother, you come, you share with us what God's put on your heart.
Man, that's a long walk. <laughs> Grab that microphone. Real quick, <clears throat> that video, um, I won't, I may talk about it a little bit later, but that video <clears throat> just got finished yesterday. So you're the first people to see it. That video was completely done by our student body. And there was no professional assistance other than our photography vocational teacher, uh, Eric. This is Brett. Brett was in some of those pictures. Brett took some of those pictures that you saw along with the other students. So that, that was their take on a day in the life at Salem Ranch. So I'm going to be quiet for a minute because he's got a busy schedule. And uh, Brett's going to share with you uh, a good part of his story. And then I'll finish. Hello. All right, we're good. We're good. All right. So uh, my name is Brett Backer. Uh, I'm 16, and uh, I'm going to tell you my testimony. I'm basically going to break this up into uh, three parts: uh, before Salem, during Salem, and after Salem. And uh, yeah, here I go. So uh, born on June 11, 2002. Uh, pretty good childhood. Uh, uh, raised good. Both parents are there. Um, uh, behavior was always a challenge for me, like behaving in school and concentrating and getting my work done. So um, I was always in trouble in school and uh, not getting my work done, getting bad grades. But that really started to do, uh, really started to happen um, in freshman year of high school. Uh, I kind of ha- uh, fell into the wrong group and started hanging with people I shouldn't have been hanging with. Uh, I was in wrestling freshman year and. Uh, finished that, but then didn't go back sophomore year. So uh, during freshman year, I was doing drugs and uh, d- drinking alcohol, uh, hanging out with the wrong friends, like I said, and uh, getting myself into things that um, <clears throat> I shouldn't have been getting myself into. Um, I started skipping school a little bit at the end of freshman year and not going to school or ditching classes or uh, being disres- disrespectful to my teachers as well as my parents. Uh, my mom started to drink alcohol like pretty frequently uh, freshman year throughout my when I was doing wrestling and while I was in school and when I wasn't going to school and she continued to drink and me and her relationship got worse progressively and uh, we started arguing a lot and getting into fights I didn't listen to her um, me and my dad is me and my dad have always got along uh, so it was kind of like um, a battle in the home a little bit me and my dad were close and me and my mom weren't uh, we were always fighting, and me and my dad were always having a good time and uh, uh, doing stuff we liked doing. Um, sophomore year at the beginning, um, I didn't I didn't go to school um, barely any. Uh, ditched a lot of school, um, skipped a lot of classes, and was being very disrespectful. Uh, once again this year, it was worse uh, sophomore year because I was uh, barely home and just hanging out with wrong friends and ev- doing even more drugs and selling drugs. Um, sophomore year and pretty much got into uh, really bad stuff sophomore year. Um, About three months into sophomore year, um, my mom told me that I was going to go away for uh, a year or so. And uh, when I first heard that, I didn't believe her, and I thought that she was making stuff up and that I actually wasn't going to do that. She was just saying that so I could change and do better. And so um, when I heard that, uh, I didn't think it was true, obviously, but um, I didn't care. I started not caring. I started even uh, letting my grades drop to D's and F's and not passing my classes. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, when she said that, uh, didn't care, like I said. And then uh, uh, trying to think. So it's about a month till I come to Salem. And uh, my grandpa died in July, and so that was really hard on my mom. Previous to that, her, her brother died, so that was that was a part of the reason she was indulging in a lot of alcohol. And so she was getting drunk every night. Um, so about a week or so before um, I ended up coming to Salem, uh, my mom told me that I was coming. And uh, still didn't believe her, still thought she was just saying that because she wanted me to do better 
and things. And so Monday came that week and got in the car just thinking we're going to go to some close place and it was only going to be there for a few hours and then I was going to come home. And that's what it was going to be like every day. And so we were in the car for about like two and a half, three hours, and then we got to Salem. I wasn't happy at all. I didn't want to be there. Um, got there and uh, actually did pretty well for my first two weeks. Like I did I, I, what I was supposed to and did what I was asked to. And that, like those first two weeks are kind of like the learning period where you're learning what the program's about, what you're expected to do, and how you're expected to do it. Um, and like the morning procedures and things. So my first two weeks were very good. I didn't get in any trouble, um, did what I was supposed to. Um, I, I was doing the bare minimum, but that was better than not doing anything at all in their opinion. And so um, after I got, after I, after I was there for about four or five weeks, uh, things, uh, I kind of came on, kind of came unglued. Um, like I would, I would get very uh, mad uh, just over small things that like I wouldn't get. Or, I, or if I didn't want to do something, uh, I would throw a fit and get mad. And so, um, so, like, three for, like, I say for about a month uh, after those two weeks, I was um, getting into a lot of trouble there, and um, I ended up running away. Um, I ran away. I got flipped out of bed that morning. And then um, I wasn't having it, so I took a walk across the cornfields. And then I was brought back by the uh, sheriff, and then um, we had a long talk with um, Mr. Terry and uh, Gabe and some other people at the ranch, trying to figure out what was going on, and um, I didn't really want to talk, and I wasn't going to tell them what was going on. So after that, uh, things, things started getting better. Um, started started uh, caring and actually trying to get through the program instead of just doing the bare minimum and being lazy. Uh, started working hard, started doing good in school. At first, school was a big problem. Um, uh, I didn't want to do it, and I was very unmotivated, but um, after I ran away, that quickly changed. I was motivated. I wanted to get a lot of schoolwork done, and I wanted to do what I was supposed to be doing. And uh, in, in April, um, I accepted Christ into my life, and he accepted me into his life. Um, that was... <laughs> I was in school, and uh, Miss Q, the teacher, she saw that um, I was I was starting to show a little bit of the fruit of the spirit, and that I was a little curious what was going on, because there had been some other um, students there that were almost done with the program, um, and that I could see that like what was going on in their life, that like um, like what they were doing and how they were acting. Uh, I wanted to be like that, so um, I went into the hallway with Miss Q and uh, prayed and. Um, I asked him into my life, and he accepted me. And um, ever since uh, I accepted him, been I've been I went through the program really fast. Um, not that that's not that that's a bad thing, but uh, I just went through it very fast and uh, made up for a lot of lost time. The, made up for a lot of lost time at the beginning, and uh, which helped me to get done quicker in ten months. Um, so that was very good. And then. Um, after Salem, uh, I've been home for about like two and a half, three weeks now. Um, things have been going really good. Me and my mom, uh, she, she quit drinking and smoking uh, cigarettes. So uh, that was really big. So um, we're not getting in any fights. And I forgave her for all the things um, she did to me and all the things I'd done to her and um, how it's made our relationship worse. And we forgave each other for that. And um, yeah, for two weeks, I got a job. Uh, working at a bar and grill. Um, a lot of the stuff that I learned at Salem, um, like in the kitchen and, and such, doing chores and such, helped me at the restaurant and getting my job. Uh, I learned how to do welding and horseback riding, uh, like in the video, wood shop, and I, I was on the bee team, the beekeeping team, so that was really cool. Salem taught me to, uh, how to deal with my anger when I was angry and um, to turn to God instead of uh, to other things like drugs or something, and to pray and give God um, my burden instead of holding on to it and holding on to grudges just to let go and forgive people. Um, so Salem, Salem was a huge um, part of my life and helped me to turn my life around and um, 
get my life back on the right path, and I'm back in school and junior year, and um, it's going very well so far. Um, going to school and getting all my uh, homework done. So thank you guys for everything you guys do. Thank you guys for supporting the ranch, and thank you guys for letting me share, your, share my story with you guys tonight. Thank you. Brett, when you go back, because you're, when you go back, because you're getting ready to leave, I left my glasses back there. Will you grab them? They're either on the floor or in that chair and bring them up here for yeah. me. You can just hand them to me here. <clears throat> Do I need to really speak? Uh, just so you know, he did that without notes. And uh, I didn't tell him what to say. Actually, about a month ago when I was talking with... Uh, David and Susan uh, Blosser, I said, you know, I might, I might bring a student with me this time just for you to meet. And I knew Brett was finishing the program, and, uh, but I thought he was still going to be in the program. And uh, he was just moving along. And so his completion, uh, his graduation party at the program was October the 15th. And um, we actually, I think in the video, there's a video, it's actually Brett that uh, I was having the opportunity to baptize on his final day while his family was there and the staff and the, the place was just packed. It was amazing. Um, and I said, do you still want to go because you're, you're really done with the program? And, and I've never really taken a guy with me before. But um, uh, he said, no, sure, I'll go. So here we are. Uh, got up at 3 a.m. on, uh, I don't even remember now, I'm lost the days. We flew out. Uh, Tuesday, I think it was, and got here, and, and we fly out at 3 or 4 tomorrow morning again at the airport because our annual banquet is tomorrow night, and so we have to be back for that, and I wasn't thinking of that when we planned this, um, but uh, that was from his heart, and, and every bit of it is as true as can be, and, and when he thanked you for that, that's... That's really why we're here, is just, you know, we're a long way away. You don't see that every day. So the video was just to give you a glimpse. I really put the pressure on them because they were making it new for Thursday night. And I said, oh, by the way, I need that Monday. I said, we're going to show it to the church. And uh, so they gave me an unedited version as best they could, and they didn't really want me to show that one. And, and I think yesterday evening sometime they sent me a text and said, hey, the finished versions on YouTube, so here it is, and um, Brett, it would be, they would be in the chair where we were sitting, or on the floor, I left my glasses, but the good news is, I brought my large print Bible tonight, uh, I have notes, hopefully I can see them, um, but I don't know where I laid my glasses, anyway, Brett, thank you as you go to speak uh, with the youth group. And, and just share with them some truths about his life. We counsel with the family, and, and you know, it's interesting because with Brett, oh, thank you, and his family, just like Brett, thank you, brother, for the, for the first month or so, the family doesn't really want you to know what's going on, right? So you, you just begin to build trust, and that's why the program takes, usually when I get a new family to call or a parent or a single parent, whatever it is, um, they'll ask, you know, how long the program is. And I usually tell them somewhere the average is between 10 to 14 months, and it really takes around 12 months. Um, the fastest, if, if literally you did everything from day one to the last day on how many days it takes at a minimum, it's nine months and three weeks. Brett started on January 15th, and he finished on October the 15th. He did it in nine months and four weeks, ten months. So he really did. And, you know, Brett and I have had many opportunities along with other staff that have talked to them. And the changes in his life, he hasn't done. And that's when he mentioned the fruit of the Spirit. We really begin to just see it in him because he didn't come in waving a flag and said, hey, you know, uh, God and I are good now or anything like that. He just one day, we had begun to notice things were different. And then the conversation came up, and he said, yes, Mr. Terry, I, I accepted Christ into my life. And um, I'm telling you, 
I, I don't know what else you say about that. So um, let me get started so we can get home uh, by 10 o'clock, Esther. I've, I, um, I want to do it justice. Um, first of all, thank all of you. Thank Calvary Road Baptist Church, seriously, uh, for sharing your Wednesday service with us. It's never fun to hear a missionary, so bear with me. I'm going to hopefully the first two things. I probably should have sat down after that, and you would have enjoyed the evening. Um, thank you, David and Susan. Um, really, without your walk with the Lord, without your tenderness to God's call and instruction to love and support Salem for Youth, um, we really wouldn't have been here tonight or two years ago. And thank you, Pastor. Thank you for being a man who loves his flock. Jesus asked Peter, you know, three times. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, you know, the first time answered, and the next couple of times he's like, well, yes, Lord, you, you, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Pastor, I know with a spirit of discernment that you love the Lord because you feed his sheep the truth week in and week out. <clears throat> Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles. We'll just spend a little time together in Isaiah 44. Actually, we'll be looking at the sum and kind of the entirety of chapters 44, 45, and 46. Now, <laughs> before you exit, uh, because of time and, 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 and rest easy, I will not be preaching tonight uh, exegetically on verse by verse through those three chapters. I do, however, want us to just focus for a minute together on a recurring message here in this passage. You know, sometimes it's a good exercise to just take a passage and, and maybe just do a word study on it as you read in your, in your private Bible time together. Or, or maybe you're going to do a, take a passage or a section of Scripture and do a historical study on it. Break it down. Try to actually understand the relationships of time frames and, and the history side of it. Too often, we just read our Bibles and, and really feeling good that I read my Bible today, and it really feels good when somebody happens to ask me, you know, did you read today? Oh, yeah, I read, I read this morning. I can't probably really tell you what I read. So I want to challenge us a little bit as we look at these three chapters to maybe just take a little different perspective for a minute. Um, I also want to make a clear statement that I believe most all the time, aside a few special occasions, surely, all scripture should be preached, whether a passage, a chapter, an entire book, word by word, sentence by sentence, reading the text, explaining the text, and applying the text, as I confidently know your pastor does. I'd like to look at something tonight, and this is where the deer hunting probably came into my sermon a little bit, Pastor, as... It, <clears throat> What I want to look at in these three chapters briefly, and then I'll tie this together with you and us in Salem, is this theme is clear, and it's aimed at the heart and mind and soul of every man, woman, and teenager here tonight and on this earth. It is aimed at the heart like a, like a hunter's arrow really is, sharpened and honed to make a devastating strike to the intended target's heart. Isaiah 44, bear with me here as I just read verses 1 and 2. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not. O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jezreel, whom I have chosen. Jacob, his servant. Israel, his people. Chosen. Chosen then. God's people, right? Those who, who he had chosen. Chosen today. God's people. So this scripture, as is with all of scripture, was relevant then, at this time, historically, to those people. 
then it is fully and undeniably relevant today. We can, we can have conversations with others about Old Testament and New Testament, but I'll tell you something, without one, you don't understand the other, and without the other, you don't understand the, what, the first one. It's clear. God laid this passage on my heart for tonight, yet I'm amazed that God works greater, higher, into the future with our past, preparing and training our hearts. First Samuel 2, verse 2, Hannah's prayer. She says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Now those of you that attend Calvary Road Baptist Church would or should find that passage somewhat familiar, I would think. Your pastor just preached on it recently. But how fitting for tonight's word. Hannah prayed, and right out of the gate with her prayer, she acknowledges, there is none like thee, O Lord, none beside thee. This theme begins in Genesis, and it goes all the way through Revelation. The Lord said through and to his prophet, here Isaiah, the man Isaiah, to Israel the following. Now listen, we're going to do something, and I'm going to go quick through three chapters. So bear with me. I'm not going to read every verse, but I want you to begin to catch the theme of what we're going to look at and what we are looking at. So fasten your seatbelts. Here I go. I'll try to tell you where I'm reading so you can somewhat... Follow along. In verse 1, he said, I have chosen. In verse 2, he says, I have chosen. Verse 3, he says, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. And he says, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. Get this. And my blessing upon thy offspring. Verse 6, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Verse 7, I shall call, I appointed, and the things that are coming, and the things that shall come. Verse 8, fear ye not, neither be afraid, have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? You are even my witness, is there a God beside me? Yes, there is no God. I know not any. Flip over to verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Verse 22. I, this is key, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud your sins, thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Verse 24, I am the Lord that maketh all things. Verse 26, I will raise up the decayed places. Verse 27, and I will dry up the rivers. Chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, who had been prophesied far earlier that he was going to be used by God to do these very things. He says, for I have holden, I have, I have held to subdue the nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings. Verse 2, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break into pieces the gates of brass and cut them to pieces. Verse 3, I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. Can I tell you something? I, again, I don't want to I don't want to get preach. I don't want to preach tonight. The treasures of the secret places. Can I tell you something about the secret places? Do a little word search through the King James Version. When God talks about the secret places, get in your prayer closet and find God, and he's going to give you the treasures in the secret place, the treasures hidden in the darkness. We don't do that often enough. We go to him for a want list instead of his list. 
<clears throat> he says in verse 4, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect. What's he say? I have even called you by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Cyrus didn't know him yet. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee. Verse 6, there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. <clears throat> Here's where the world's going to have trouble with Scripture. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Verse 8, I, the Lord, have created it. Verse 12, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. The end of verse 14, surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. We're almost done. Verse 18, the very end of verse 18, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 19, I, the Lord, speak righteousness, and I declare things that are right. Get that. God is the standard. Boy, the world tells us different on that. Verse 21, have not I, the Lord, and there is no God else beside me? Get this, a just God. There's justice. And a Savior. There is none beside me. Here's the verse that changed Charles Haddon Spurgeon's life. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. That's everyone. For I am God and there is none else. And verse 23, I have even sworn by myself, thy word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and it shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Chapter 46, verse 4. <clears throat> Even to your old age, to the elderly. There's not really anybody here tonight that age. I am He. I carry you. I have made and I will bear and I will carry you. Be encouraged. <laughs> Be encouraged. You know, Brett said, Mr. Terry, he said, Whew, I'm a little nervous. I didn't know this place was big. And I laughed and we joked and we've talked through the afternoon a bit about just nerves. And uh, I said, you know what, though, I'm going to remind you after it's over and we're having Dairy Queen watching the ball game tonight back in the hotel room. Look, you lived. I said, God sustained you right through it, didn't he? I'm going to remind you of that tonight. <clears throat> Verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it and I will also do it. Verse 12, Hearken unto me, listen, you stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. I will place salvation in Zion. For Israel, my glory. Just a little side note there. I bring near my righteousness. Can I tell you something? We don't search for God. He comes for us. Well, that's a mouthful. If I could only tell you how many times I've read that scripture and I have had a blast reading it. I'm not kidding you. A month ago when I started reading this, God, for whatever reason, laid it on my heart. Then I hear this series in Samuel and Hannah's heart. There is none like our rock. <clears throat> So what do we get from this? God chooses. God created. God creates. God sustains. God carries. God provides. God redeems and God restores. God renews. God promised. 
God delivers and Jesus saves. God comes after us, not the other way around. Listen, Brett did not come to Salem looking for Christ. <laughs> we've, we've talked about that with the other students. Brett, did you come to Salem looking for a man named Jesus? No, sir, Mr. Terry, I did not. What did you come for? I didn't. I wouldn't have chose to come to Salem. He's right. I met with his mom and his grandmother. His dad didn't come to the meeting. I met with his mom and his grandmother about a month and a half before we accepted Brett. And she pleaded, man, she pleaded, but she didn't tell me everything. Brett did not choose Salem. Can I tell you something? The Holy Ghost had a warrant out for his arrest. And God used you. Now hear me, church. God used you. And he used others to help facilitate Brett's freedom from sin's bondage. Amen? Yes. He did. That's why I want to encourage you tonight. That's why I hope this message really sets your feet on fire for what this community literally is about to see. Why this? Why, why tonight? What, what has this to do with you or Salem for Youth Ranch tonight? Well, I'm going to tell you it has everything to do with you and with Salem for Youth Ranch. Because for it is God alone who does it. It is God alone who sustains it. And it is God alone who will save. Your church, can I just be honest with you? Your church doesn't exist because of you. Your church exists because of God in you. The ranch doesn't exist because of us. It exists because of God in us. Get in and get on, man. It's great. I'm telling you. It's hard, and there's no safer place than in the arms of Jesus Christ. And thank goodness he allows U-turns. We come to church because God compels us to, despite our wicked hearts. You participate because God has a work that will be done and He, for His own purpose, has willed you to carry it out for His glory. It told us that, right? Israel, His glory. Not for Israel's glory, for God's glory. You know, chapel at the ranch is not required. I don't know that I ever really thought I needed to make it required or didn't make it required. I just know when we eliminated the state and any federal funding, one reason was because we were going to have chapel and church on Sunday. And I didn't want them telling us we couldn't do it. You know something? Brett didn't come looking for God, but he never missed a chapel service on Sunday morning. Explain it. I, I can't. He's in the horse barn, and him and Seth are having life conversations, and all of a sudden, it's the gospel laid out. Mrs. Q is his classroom school teacher. And she's got him in the hallway and they're on their knees because she's seeing something going on in his life. And she stops the class, lets the other boys go with the other teacher. They're still doing their work. They're in the hallway taking care of business. <clears throat> you have been called into the highways and byways, telling the truth, sharing the gospel, and telling the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, same goes for us at the Salem Ranch, really. We did not save Brett. God saved Brett. What we did do is we told Brett there is none other God and there is none like our God. God saved Brett. God changed Brett and is changing his heart. No man, not even Brett, can pluck himself out of the hand of Christ. I believe that with all my heart. Jude chapter 1. I believe it's the only chapter. Verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, it is unto who? Him. And to him to present you faultless. That was some of the best news Brett ever heard. That he was going to be faultless. That song that you sang, where's that couple? Praise the Lord. My goodness. But he stood up in the blood of Christ covered you it is God and God alone we are not saved by our good works we are saved by his grace through faith alone in Christ alone praise God for his work in my life your life and in Brett's life 
<clears throat> Listen, church, I know the saying goes, sometimes you're preaching to the choir. And there's probably some good reasons why people here aren't here on a Wednesday night, but I'm going to tell you something. This is God's choir. I believe you know this, but church, so often we live life as if we don't know this. Do you know there's 66 verses in those three passages that I just read in chapter 44, 45, and 46, if I counted right? And do you know that nearly 60 times God either said, I have, or I will, or I something? That's almost every verse. Do you think just maybe God is wanting Israel? He's wanting you and I today? You know, I, I don't want to get into, you know, I don't even know what the word is. My, my, some of the guys, some of my staff around the ranch use it, you know, as you believe it's Israel and, and today's church and all that. Can I tell you something? It's the entire word of God and it is the truth, period. If it applied then, it applies now. He died on the cross to save you and I. <clears throat> I think he's wanting us to know today that it is him that does the work and will do the work. He's increased your church for some reason. You ever ask yourself why? Why? so cool to hear you can't even name all the people all the programs that you support that don't bother me a bit I don't want to be the only one because we're in trouble and if you add the other 14 or so times that God says there is none besides me I am the Lord and there is none else it averages out to be more than one every verse in those three chapters don't fall asleep on this, church. Yet, the late world-renowned physicist Stephen Hawkins, he wrote his last book, and it got published after his death this year. And it concludes, and I quote, There is no possibility of God in our universe. Hawkins has also said at previous times, we are each free to believe what we want, and it is my view that the simplest explanation is, there is no God. Now I'm quoting, no one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization, he said, there is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe. And for that, he says, I am extremely grateful. In September of 2014, he was a keynote speaker, and he said the following, Before we understood and understand science, so as you're a kid growing up and you don't understand science, he says, it is natural to believe that God created the universe. But now science offers a more convincing explanation. He then goes on to say, what I meant by, he had made a previous comment, we would know the mind of God. He says, here's what I meant by that, is we would know everything that God would know if there was a God, which there isn't, closed quote. Apparently, he never read Isaiah. This guy, by the way, he has sold multi-million copies of his books just one book. His first book was over 10 million copies in 35 languages today. Don't kid yourself. The world's reading it as fast as they can get it. He also has an entire series of children's books. Extremely popular. Millions. Some of those are now translated in 40 languages. And get this, he has been given some of the most prestigious awards this world has to offer. As a matter of fact, he's received 18 of them in his lifetime. One of them in 2009 for none other 
than the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He knows nothing of freedom. He is a captive agent of Satan himself. In addition, he stated, if you like, you can call the laws of science God if you want, but it wouldn't be a personal God, and surely not one we could pose question to. Hmm. You know, Hannah knew something. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 6, just a little further along, she says, the Lord killeth and the Lord maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and he bringeth up. God made Brett, who was a dead boy walking. He made him alive. God, and there is none other, there is none like him. He works his will and his good pleasure daily on the ranch. And he works his will and good pleasure in the life of the families. And it doesn't always go the way we think it should. That's good news. He is perfect and holy, and we are not. Stephen Hawking, on the morning of March 14th, 2018, at the age of 76, he instantly came face to face with the Lord Almighty. Science was Mr. Hawkins' idol. And in these same chapters, as Isaiah prophesied, and that's much of what he's prophesying the judgment about, it says this, a deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his own soul. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. I assure you, Mr. Hawkins, bow the knee and confess with the tongue God's lordship, and he did it in anguish. I don't mock him. I'm saddened by it, if you want to know the truth. We have young men that come to the ranch, and it's not uncommon for months. I hate this God. I don't like him. I don't think he exists. That's usually the next place they go. They don't want nothing to do with him. And all we can do is pray harder and longer. We can't just dismiss it. Don't dismiss it. Can I tell you something? I, I take the boys of Salem anywhere. And when we walk in a place, most of the time they think, oh, uh, uh, a school's coming or a, a church youth group. Sometimes people seem to think the boys of Salem Ranch have three eyes and four arms. There's something different about them. You wouldn't know the difference if Brett was walking in your high school right now down the hallway halls. Because I'm going to tell you why. If there's 1,000 students, there's 990 of them that need help. I speak publicly, and I get asked to some of the world's conversations. I don't, I don't like it. God doesn't let me out of it, but I don't like it. But something I've never liked is when I hear at-risk youth. Well, these are at-risk youth. Can I tell you something? Every teenage boy and girl that walks out your front door on the morning to go to school is at risk. And God laid it on you. You know your child or your grandchild or your neighbor's kid, God calls that child a blessing, period. He doesn't say it's only a blessing if that family's saved. He says that child's a blessing. Well, I'll tell you what, they come with some thoughts and some perceptions of what life is about. Mr. Hawkins had his, but I'll guarantee you the record's been set straight with that man. And I pity him, I do. <clears throat> As I close tonight, listen. I can't help but get excited when I talk about the ranch. But my excitement is that God is doing something. God is at work and we see it. Tell the world and tell the church. You know, we had a young man, Vince, been at the ranch maybe a week. His dad had died when he was 11. So he just kind of became a couch potato and 
wouldn't do what mom said, started running around the crowd, smoking quite a bit of weed and could care less. He really actually wanted to kind of die. We accepted him into the program. And about the first week there, he's in the wood shop with Kenny. And you don't have to be there too long to kind of know what we're about. And Lord willing, it'll always be that clear. And Vince said to Kenny, I'll never forget it. He looked at him and said, how do you meet this Jesus guy you keep talking about? Kenny just smiled at him. He said, you stay here long enough, we'll introduce you to him. I used to think for about my first three years at Salem, I was actually kind of depressed. I was frustrated and brokenhearted because, you know, the world doesn't want to hear about God. We, we, we tell ourselves they do. If they just hear it, and then we won't even tell them because we're too afraid they're going to reject it. Well, he says they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. But anyway, I used to just, it really bothered me until about the last year and a half. And then I began to realize something. One, when God's done, God's going to be done. But he won't be done until that last chosen elect person has been born again. And what I started to flip around was, I'm not depressed that these boys are coming in not knowing who Jesus is. I'm encouraged because surely God's not done. This is a whole new mission field. Can I tell you something? The further the world drifts away from God, the truth is, the easier it is for you and I to be able to introduce them to Jesus Christ. My wife grew up, and she would tell you, she grew up, they didn't go to church, it wasn't a Christian home, but all of her friends and in her high school, they all knew who God was, and they all went to vacation Bible school, and you said prayer before, you said a pledge of allegiance, and whatever else, okay, <clears throat> but they knew that there was this God that's talked about. The boys coming into the ranch have not even heard his name. I'm not kidding you. And by the way, it wasn't the government that took God out of the school. You know, the school's ran by a school board. Who sits on the school board? Well, parents do. It's not the government's job to put God back in our homes. It's us. It's us. Sorry, Pastor, I'm off my notes. Listen, church, your faithfulness because i got to tell you this, and I, I promise I'll, I'll close. I'm done. Brett, Vince, all the boys you saw in that video, not one student pays full tuition to come to the ranch. Because it can't. We tell the families full tuition is $5,500 a month. I pray the Lord will be gracious to us because the actual cost is $11,000 a month. But who can even stomach that when they're in a moment of depression and disaster and they're looking for hope? And we got hope! <clears throat> Vince's mom paid $500 a month for her son to be at the program who came to met Jesus Christ. Brett's family, I'll just put it this way, they couldn't afford much more than that. But you, along with others, gave sacrificially, obediently, you loved us and invited us into your home when did we do this, Lord? When you did it to the least, you did it to me. I'm going to tell you, the angels rejoiced over one. Church, after tonight, I kid you not, I want you to go home. And this is not about Brett. Brett was just willing to come along and, and share. I don't know what he's telling your youth group. <laughs> I, I don't. I know this. It'll be the truth. But rejoice 
hug each other and say, praise the Lord, we're not even there. And this young man had the opportunity to meet Christ and the Holy Ghost arrested him. And that's a warrant that won't be denied, by the way. But God might find others to minister it if we don't. I don't want to miss out on that. I don't. You as a church, stay faithful to all the ministries that you serve and support. Seriously. Beyond Salem for Youth Ranch. Stay faithful. Use discernment, but be, be faithful. We just wanted to share with you tonight to encourage you Though we may be hundreds of miles away, take heart. God is using you in ways and places you have no idea. Huh. But you'll be given a crown for your faithfulness. Revelation 4, 10 and 11 tells us that. I won't read it, but I will say this. Won't it be grand finally at that moment to have something to give back to our God. There's going to be people in heaven we never thought should have been there. But somebody somewhere shared the gospel. Somebody somewhere gave 10 bucks. Somebody somewhere said, I'm just going to pray in the secret place. And you may not see the treasure of the secret place until you get there. But I'm telling you right now, I believe with all of my heart, oh, what a treasure we will find. Let's pray. And if you would, just bear with me. I read this and as I was getting on the plane. So I, I want to pray a prayer, a Puritan prayer. And I just want this to be our prayer tonight. O oh God of love, I approach thee with encouragements derived from your character. For I am not left to feel after thee in the darkness of my nature, nor to worship you as the unknown God. I cannot find out thy perfections, but I know thou art good and that you're ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy. Thou hast displayed your wisdom and power and goodness in all thy works, and has revealed thy will in the scripture of truth. Thou hast caused it to be preserved, translated, published, and multiplied, so that all men may possess it and find thee in it. O Lord, here I see the greatness and thy grace, thy pity and thy rectitude, thy mercy and thy truth, thy being and men's hearts. Through it thou hast magnified thy name and favored mankind with the gospel. Have mercy on me, for I have ungratefully received thy benefits, little improved my privileges, made light of my spiritual things, disregarded thy messages, contended with examples of the good, rebukes of conscience, admonitions of friends, leadings of providence. I deserve that thy kingdom be taken away from me, O Lord. I confess my sin with feeling and lamentation, a broken heart, a contrite spirit, self-abhorrence, self-condemnation, and self-despair. Give me relief by Jesus, my hope, faith in his name of Savior, forgiveness by His blood, strength by His presence, holiness by His Spirit, and let me love Thee with all my heart. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Man, I'm telling you. What a reminder tonight. You know, a lot of times we don't get to see the fruit. God lets you see some fruit tonight. He lets you see one that he redeemed. 
and your giving was a part of that. Uh, I hope we don't take that for granted. What an opportunity tonight we had because God brought right in front of us a young man that without the intervention of God, and it was God that done it, who knows where this young man would be tonight. Take a lot of guts to stand up in front of people and say what he said. You don't stand up in front of a church crowd and confess I was doing drugs and selling drugs and drinking alcohol. You, you just don't say things like that. But he did because he's not ashamed. And here's the reason, because I'm not what I used to be. You know, when you see that in somebody, they're not afraid to tell their story because they're not what they used to be because of the blood of Jesus. And uh, I'm telling you, that guy, just he, he's just one among many. One among many. Why are we involved in Salem Ranch for Youth? Because God connected those dots. He wanted us involved. He just read these major statements out of Scripture. I do what I do. I'm God. There's none like me. I do this. So explain to me how we... A church in Haywood County is involved in a place hundreds of miles away because God put the dots together. It's God that done it. I don't know. None of us are smart enough to do that. And God knew what he was doing. He knows what he's doing tonight. He'll continue to do what he's doing. And Brett, we love you, man. Thank you for being so honest tonight. Uh, thank you for standing up and letting us see you. Because it just makes us want to do more. I don't know about y'all, but it just makes me want to do more. Rescue in the parish and care for the dying. If you're not exactly sure, because some of you, Salem Ranch for Youth, that's brand new to you. You don't have a clue who this guy is. You don't know what they're doing. But I hope you could catch a little bit desperate parents, desperate families saying, I can't do anything else with this kid. I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do with this guy. And, and so there they sit saying, well, we know how to introduce them to Jesus. We also know how to introduce them to work. And we're not going to take any government funding. We're not going to take any state funding so that we can stand in front of your precious child, whoever it is, grandchild, and we're going to give them Jesus over and over and over again. And that's what we're going to do is just present them to Jesus through the avenues of work and discipline, Bible study. It's just the way it's going to be. And that's what God does. And he's redeeming souls that way. And uh, I'm very much appreciative for the good work you all are doing. And church family, we can't go wrong giving Jesus. We just can't go wrong. Uh, I think too many times, and I hope and pray you hear my heart. I hope I don't come across wrong with this. We are giving people a lot of things. But you don't go wrong giving them Jesus. We can give food. We can give clothes. But if we don't give them Jesus, we have a hungry belly that is filled. We have a cold back that is warm. And they are still destined to. For a devil's hell without any knowledge of who Jesus is. But we can't go wrong giving them Jesus. You just can't go wrong. And, uh, and brother, we are in your court. Uh, we are in your court. We are appreciative for what Salem Ranch is doing. Um, they are on the front lines every single day of trying to rescue these young men from the clutches of the devil. I'll never forget when I would go to Jacksonville and preach and I'd, <laughs> I'd see them down there working. Uh, I'd see how they'd get out in the fields and they had to bale hay. They had work they had to do. They had to work the fields. They had to work in the gardens. And now all of a sudden in 2018, that's punishment. You are punishing those kids. Uh, I wish somebody would have told Papa that. I wish somebody would have told my my grandparents and my dad, what, that that is punishment. That was not punishment. And so this past week, I was telling Josh at lunch the other day, I was listening to Adrian Rogers preach, and Adrian Rogers was preaching about your job. 
and how you ought to work your job. You should see your job as a blessing from God. You ought to make your job useful. It's a benefit. Be faithful to your job. Listen to what he goes on to say. The Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. And I sat back under conviction hearing that. Because if we're not careful, watch what we're doing in 2018. It's hand out, hand out, hand out, hand out. And the biblical view is if they won't work, they shouldn't eat. That's what the Bible says. Am I right? That's what the Bible says. And, and God expects if we're healthy and able, but also God expects us for those that cannot, who cannot physically labor, they are unable physically to do it, we ought to stand up in their stead. Uh, but, you know, I think if we're not careful, church, we, we don't have many Salem ranches for youth because they go about it from a disciplined work standpoint that says let's get after it, do it right, uh, immerse you in the word, but immerse you in your studies, your work, immerse you in scripture, and I appreciate that. I thank you for being biblical. It's not popular, but, uh, but God uses it. God does use it. What part of Illinois are you in again? Central Illinois, where the deer are massive. Two hours south of Chicago, to give you some bearing. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Said, I've got a grandson living in Salem, Illinois, that needs to go to that ranch. Can you set up an interview here tonight? Brother Terry, how many do you all take at a time? Twelve. Wow, 26 full-time staff for 12. That's a big undertaking. Amen. And the program, uh, can, can somebody hand... Do me a favor. Run that mic back there. Not you. Take just a quick second, if you would, brother. We've got so many new people. What what does what is the day to day routine? Uh, what y'all do? Sure. Um. Mic one. Okay, you're good. Is it on? There we go. So, um, parents, um, Christian families, non-Christian families, there's no prerequisite there. We just look at the application, and if we think we're able to help, and this young man is a fit for what we do in the family, because if you want to know the truth, the, the, the real direction we're going is after mom or after dad. And if it's a Christian family, which we should be taking care of the household of faith first, we want to encourage them and strengthen them and come alongside them. So a young man comes to Salem, and um, a day would look uh, like this. I'll go real fast. 6.30, 6.40 in the morning, they're up, and they're getting ready for school. And uh, they're cleaning the room and getting dressed and ready. And a little after 7, half the students head out that week. And they have to take care of the horse barn and the animals and feed them and water them before they come in for breakfast. The other half of the students stay in the cottage and they mop the floors, clean the windows, vacuum the carpet. And now they have Punishment. Headed. Punishment. Yeah. These are guys that wouldn't even, you know, they would walk through the door at home and the coat and the shoes were still at the front door, right? Again, there no, there's, these are your children. These are your neighbor's children. Um, and so then at... 7.45, everybody meets in the cafeteria for breakfast. And it's seven, three meals a day, seven days a week, and they're all hand-prepared meals in the cafeteria. And um, then after breakfast is over at 8.30, half of the students go to the classroom, and the other half go out to their vocational class. And we have nine vocational classes, so that means those vocational classes is basically one teacher, one student. Sometimes it's one teacher, maybe two students. 
because we are all about the shady tree conversation, right? They counsel with Ben, our biblical counselor, or myself, but they become counseling wise. They know what to say, what not to say. The counseling is the other 23 hours a day while they're in the vocational class and in the classroom. We just don't tell them that. I can say that in front of Brett now because he's done. <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, and so then they come in at lunch at 1130. And at 1230, after the boys have done the dishes and cleaned up the cafeteria and put away the food and such, 1230, they switch. The, other, the students that were out at vocational for three hours head upstairs to the classroom and the classroom students that were in the morning head out to their vocational class, whether that's welding shop, photography, whatever it is. And the classroom's a fully certified classroom, two teachers, six boys. How much schoolwork do you think they get done? These were guys, as Brett even told in his story, he wasn't going to school, he wasn't gonna go to school. Most of them have gotten to that point. I've yet to have a young man not go to school at the ranch. Hmm. And so, it's very just one-on-one -on -one and two-on-one. -on -one. Then school's over at 3.30, just like school would be anywhere else. They all meet in the cafeteria, get a snack, and then they head out. We play sports. We play other schools in sports. So depending on where they are with their scores, because they're scored every day on behavior, talk, language, effort, and, and their personal goals, um, some will head to sports practice. Some might have weeds to pull for some behavior yesterday. Um, and then at 5 o'clock, they're all showering to make it back in for dinner at 545. After that, they're, again, there's still some free rec time and personal time to do their homework or, or whatever. And then by 9 o'clock and 930, lights out, back at it again. See, we don't want more rules. We want control. How do you get control without more rules? Because we as parents tend to just keep piling on the rules and the consequences. Control their schedule. Sun up, sun down. Amen. Wow. Busy days. Uh, Brett, how far did you get in the cornfields? Uh, like a few miles. A few miles? Yeah. Yeah? You are in pretty good shape. Where was you going? Uh, don't know. I was walking. <laughs> don't know. How many run away, Terry? Um, it's, I would say in the last three years, probably two a year, and that's always their answer. I don't know where I was going. They just... They feel like they don't have control, and the reality is they have all the control. Yeah. But they just, all of a sudden, they don't have their cell phone, they don't have social media, they don't have computers, the, there's not TV in their rooms or out in the living room, there is no, the only TV is Friday night movie night or maybe like now with the World Series, we'll, we'll watch a little of that with them. Um, so they just, all of a sudden, everything they thought was life is not there. So they're not allowed to have cell phone Wow. No. In, and, in America? And, and I, can, I can tell you right now, probably after three or four months, it didn't, it didn't really, you weren't looking for your phone. They, they, they really, be, they write letters. They begin to write their family. That oh. is the most amazing thing you've ever seen. Mm. And when they get letters, that cafeteria lights up, right? At 3.30, we hand out mail. And these guys can't wait to get mail. So... Wow. You know, people say the millennials don't get it. I'm telling you, they do. Yeah. They just want somebody to listen. Yes. And once you've listened, then what you said, Pastor, too often we want to go out and do community service. Yeah. God always, Jesus always met the physical need. Yes. But he ministered the spiritual need at the same time. I think one thing we miss, and, and before we go out the building, I want you to Spend time if you want to, loving on them. I think the, the one thing we're missing in the biggest way is discipleship. The one-on-one -on -one spending time with people. Uh, we just want people to get it in, in group settings. And I think one thing that makes Salem Ranch work is taking a kid and giving them that one-on-one -on -one time um, where they've got to be next to you, wherever that's at, uh, in shop or classroom, whatever. You're so much with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. I was blessed to grow up with a dad that spent one-on-one -on -one time. No matter where that was, that was in a tater patch or uh, uh, out in the woods cutting wood. Um, had a great memory of he and I today uh, fishing. 
I always thought neither one of us could fish. What were we doing? Uh, and so I'm out driving a bus this morning, missing Dad like crazy, but thinking about that fishing trip. And it was freezing cold. We couldn't catch the fish. We fed a whole can of corn to one trout. Uh, and we still never caught it. And on the way back home, Dad said, let's stop at these ponds. We'll catch one. We can't go home empty-handed. Said, your mom will laugh us. So we, we stopped. It was the one-on-one -on -one time that Dad spent with me talking to me, um, you know, I think that's, that's where our biggest mess up. We expect people to come sit among 700 and get it. And nobody is spending the one-on-one -on -one time with them. Nobody's pulling that person next to them saying, hey, let's go eat and let me just hang out with you, see where you're at. Let's just talk, you know, and spend some time together. Discipleship works. Mentoring people works. It's what makes a, a big difference. And I pray God will use us to be mentors in people's lives. Little ones, big ones, whoever it may be, uh, wherever God may send us. Fisher of men. That's exactly right. Well, I hope we fish better for men than we did those trout. Amen. Sure do love you guys and appreciate you, church. Uh, thank you for coming and hearing tonight. We don't get these opportunities. You can tell how busy they are. He's got to get right back on a plane early in the morning and get gone. And uh, so we, we wanted to, to get this in and get this scheduled if we could, where you could just tonight you can take a face, take Brett's face home. I'll always take not only your face, Brett, but the way you ate those chicken wings. Um, I'm telling you. The kid laid down on some chicken wings yesterday, and uh, he can flat devour them like any teenager. So I'll always see him. Uh, and one way I know that you're saved, one way I know God redeemed you is you went straight for chicken. And uh, that, that's the greatest way. Y'all have a great night. Brother Terry's back there with Brett. Would you love on him as you go? And uh, be careful on the way home. Well, thanks for being with us in worship today. It is our heart's desire that through the word and through this worship service today, God has spoken to your heart and you desire to serve him and to worship him more than you ever have in your life. You know, if you've been watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is our greatest desire. If we can be a help to you, if we can uh, assist you in any way, please contact us at the information you see on the screen. We also want to thank those of you who watch us regularly. We greatly appreciate your prayer and support. Keep praying for us as we pray for you as we serve the Lord together. <laughs>